Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss about the Kubernetes components and basic architecture. In the previous video, we have seen what is Kubernetes and why we need it. In this video, we are going to see various components of Kubernetes which orchestrates the container based applications which are deployed in Kubernetes cluster. Let us start. In the diagram, we have Kubernetes cluster and the client which will invoke the Kubernetes cluster. For example, if you have a container based application and if you want to deploy that in the Kubernetes cluster, we need some nodes where we are going to deploy the container based application. Here in Kubernetes, we have the concept of worker nodes. So, in the worker nodes, the Kubernetes will deploy the container based applications. So, to run the container based applications, we need container runtime in each of the worker nodes. These container runtimes should confirm with the container runtime interface provided by CNCF. For example, we can use container D, CRIO, Docker engine, and so on as container runtimes in Kubernetes cluster. Here we are showing two worker nodes. We can have a minimum of one worker node to run our containerized application. So, once the container runtime is installed in the worker node, there is another component called Kubelet which will invoke this container runtime to create containers of our application. So, Kubelet is the component which will be installed in every worker node to create the containers of our applications. In Kubernetes, we will not have containers created directly. The containers will be created in a Kubernetes object called pod. So, pod is the basic unit in Kubernetes cluster. So, we can have one or more containers that can be run inside a single pod. For example, if you have an application that needs the containers to run together, then we can run those containers in a single pod. So, Kubelet is the component which will create pods for us and it will interact with container runtime to create containers inside the pod. Pods will be up and running in the worker nodes. But who will invoke this Kubelet to create these pods and make the containers up and running? And also who will schedule these pods in these worker nodes based on the resource requirements? Once the pods are up and running, they need to run continuously without any failures. Or if some pod failures occur, the pods need to be restarted automatically. So for all these type of requirements, Kubernetes cluster has a separate area called control plane. Control plane is a set of components that will perform the orchestration and management of these content based applications inside these worker nodes. So here we can see the five major components of control plane. The ATCD, API server, scheduler, cube control manager and cloud controller manager. Let us discuss about these components. Firstly, let us discuss about ETCD or HCD. HCD is an important component in this control plane. This stores all the data of the cluster. Here the data means the data about the nodes, the data about the pods, the data about various objects which are created in Kubernetes cluster. For example, information like what are the pods running in the cluster, which pod is running in which node of the cluster and what is the status of these pods and so on. Similar to pods, it also stores information about all other resources in the Kubernetes cluster. So, this etcd is a key value store. That means the data will be stored in terms of keys and values. Who will store the data in etcd cluster? So, here in control plane, we have another component called API server. So, this is the heart of this control plane. API server is the only component that will interact with etcd cluster inside this control plane. API server will put the information into etcd database and also it will retrieve the data from the etcd database. In addition to storing the data of the cluster, etcd cluster also has an important API called watch API. The clients can create watches in the etcd cluster. So, these watches will interact with the watch API provided by etcd cluster. So, this watch API provides an API for asynchronously monitoring the changes that occur in etcd. So, the clients will create watches in etcd. If any data is inserted or modified in etcd, the watches will notify corresponding changes to the clients. Here, the API server will be notified if any changes occurred in etcd. So, based on the event notification, the API server will perform corresponding tasks. Another important component in this control plane is API server. So, API server will provide the REST API that will be accessed by various clients. Here, the clients mean the external clients or the internal clients within the cluster. So, all other components within this cluster will interact with this API server using the API provided by API server. Here in the diagram, we can see the scheduler, controller manager, or cloud controller manager, or the kubelet or kube proxy from worker nodes all interact with API server using the REST API. The external clients also reach the API server using the API. So, what this API server does, so whenever any request comes from external client, it will validate the request and it will authenticate and authorize the user. The authentication can happen in multiple ways. 
one example authentication using the certificates provided by API server. So the clients will produce the certificate when they want to perform some task via Kubernetes cluster. Then it will authenticate based on the certificate and then authorize based on the request. Similarly, the kubelet from worker nodes will also interact with the API server using the REST API. So the kubelet can provide the information about the pods which are running in the worker nodes to the API server. So based on the API request, the API server will validate the request and then it will store corresponding information to the ETCD database. If the request is to fetch some data from the cluster, then API server will retrieve the data from ETCD database. So API server is the front end for this Kubernetes cluster. That means all the clients, both external and internal components will interact with API server using the REST API provided by API server. So now let us discuss about scheduler. Scheduler is useful to schedule the pods in each of the worker nodes based on the resource requirements of the pod and other rules like no definity, pod definity and so on. This will be discussed later. We have another component called Cube Control Manager. So Cube Controller Manager is the collection of processes which run independently in loops to maintain the desired state of the Kubernetes cluster. So there are different types of controllers we have as part of this Kubernetes Controller Manager like Node Controller, Replication Controller and so on. Let us take an example with Replication Controller. This Replication Controller will make sure the design number of pod replicas running in worker nodes. For example, if the number of replicas is 2, it will ensure the two pods of the same application running in worker nodes. Due to some reason, if pod 2 fail to run, then this replication controller will create a replica of that pod in one of these worker nodes. It ensures that there are two replicas of the same application always run in the Kubernetes cluster. That means it maintains the desired state of the pods inside the Kubernetes cluster. Similar to replication controller, we also have different controllers like node controller, job controller, service account controller. So we can discuss about this in later videos. Here we have one more component, cloud controller manager. Similar to cube controller manager, this is another component in the control plane. This component is related to cloud provider API. For example, if we deploy our cluster inside AWS, GCP, or Azure and so on. So in these environments, this component will run. So if we deploy our cluster in on-premise environments, this component will not run because it interacts with the cloud provider API and link our Kubernetes cluster with the cloud provider API. So similar to Kube controller manager, this also has number of controllers like node controller, service controller and so on. We can discuss about this in later videos when we deploy our cluster inside one of the cloud environments. So in addition to these components which were discussed till now, we have several other add-ons which are required to run this cluster. We also need other components like network add-on to create the pod network and the cluster DNS server and logging and monitoring add-ons and so on. So here, when we install the network add-on, it will create a pod network inside the cluster. That means each pod will be assigned an IP address and the pods can communicate with each other using those IP addresses. We will discuss more about this pod communication when we discuss about Kubernetes networking in later video. We have several vendors which provides these network add-ons like Calico, Beamnet, Flannel and so on. Similar to network add-on, we also need the cluster DNS server so that the names will be assigned to pods, services and so on. We will discuss more about this cluster DNS when we discuss about Kubernetes networking. We also have one more component, QProxy, which runs in worker nodes. Before discussing about QProxy, let us understand the concept of services in Kubernetes. Service is a resource in Kubernetes that will allow us to access the applications which are running in pods within the cluster or outside of the cluster. So generally when we create the pods, each pod will be assigned an IP address. But these pods are ephemeral. That means due to some reason if the pod fails to run, then a new pod will be created and the IP address will be changed. So we cannot access the application using the previous IP address. So to avoid that, we have the concept of services. So the services will point to the pods and each service will be assigned a static virtual IP address. So this IP address will not change during the lifetime of this service. So the applications can be accessed using the service instead of pods. So service will indirectly point to these pods in the backend. So this way we can use the services to access the applications within or outside of the cluster. So using QProxy, we will implement the service concept in Kubernetes. So whenever any new service is created or existing service is modified, QProxy will create a new network rule or modify the existing network rule corresponding to the service. To perform this, the QProxy can use the Network firewall rules, for example, IP table rules, 
to add or modify these network roles. That network role will contain the source IP address as the service IP address and the destination IP address will be corresponding pods IP addresses. Whenever a request comes to access the service, indirectly the request will go to corresponding pod IP address. So this way the queue proxy will implement the service concept inside Kubernetes cluster. Now we have gone through all the important components of Kubernetes cluster. So now let us understand the flow using an example. For example, if the client wants to deploy an application in the Kubernetes cluster, the client can be a kubectl or any other client which can send a REST API request to API server. For example, if this is our deployment file and we want to deploy this application inside Kubernetes cluster using kubectl. Here we are trying to deploy two pods by mentioning two replicas here. When the client sends this API request to this API server, this API server will validate the request and authenticates the user using the certificates and then it will place corresponding pod information inside this etcd database. Whenever the data corresponding to the pod is inserted to etcd, then API server will be notified using the watches in etcd. So similar to watches in etcd cluster, API server also has the watches so that other components will be notified using those watches. So in this case, for the new pod, since it is not assigned any node for the scheduling, the scheduler will be notified and then scheduler will decide using its algorithm to identify the node in which the pod will be scheduled and then it will send that response to API server. Then API server will update corresponding node name inside this etcd cluster corresponding to the pod. When the data is modified in etcd cluster, again API server will be notified using the watches and then using the watches in API server, the kubelet corresponding to the node name will be notified. For example, kubelet in node 1 or kubelet in node 2 and then it will create a pod. So once the pod is created, kubelet will interact with container runtime and the container will be created and the pod will be up and running. Again, once the pod is created, kubelet will send the data back to the API server and the status of the pod will be updated in etcd cluster. Similar to this, other components also will work like kube controller manager will maintain the desired state of the cluster based on the events in the API server. Similar to that, if any service is created or updated in the Kubernetes cluster, again the data corresponding to the service will be uploaded to etcd and then API server will be notified and using the watch in the API server, the queue proxy will be notified and queue proxy will update the IP table rules in all the nodes corresponding to the service and it will send the information back to the API server and then API server will update corresponding service information within the etcd cluster. This way all components will work together to maintain the Kubernetes cluster in a desired state. So in this video we have seen the basic architecture of the Kubernetes cluster and also the various components of Kubernetes cluster to manage and orchestrate our content based applications within the Kubernetes cluster. I hope this video helps. Thanks a lot for watching.